Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our special consideration this evening is written for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 3 and verse 4. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ, I've been hearing a lot more lately about something called buyer's remorse. You've heard of this, right? It's a sense of regret that you get after making some kind of a purchase. Usually it's some kind of a big purchase, and it seems to be worse when the decision was more difficult or was a harder choice to make. Yeah, yeah, it's a thing, and it's been a thing for a while, but all of a sudden it's really getting into the news now, and I think it's because there's so much more commerce on the internet and things that you can ship to your house, and also because the different housing markets are so volatile that it can be such a risky thing compared to the amount of of income that we have. The risks are so much greater now. So you hear a lot more about it and about the anxiety for it. In fact, like anything like this, they now designated experts in these fields, right? And so these experts say, no, no, it's not called buyer's remorse anymore. It's called post-purchase dissonance. And now they're making that into post-decision dissonance so that these, uh, these experts can spread out a little and, and be experts also in the fields of, of whether or not you should accept a job uh, offer or or. or even your election preferences when you go to vote. Buyer's remorse or buyer's regret. But now all of a sudden they're starting to talk about seller's regret too. And maybe this is because of so many people wondering, man, I got to just get out of this or that state. Or again, with the, the housing markets being so hugely different in different areas. And maybe it's a lot to do with that eBay kind of thing as well. But you're hearing about both of these. And as I was getting ready for tonight, as I was looking at Judas for tonight, I was thinking, yeah, here's a good place to put this, this post-decision dissonance, right? What regret, what remorse was was there in this, this Judas character? I mean, to just an extreme level. But as I was thinking about this, I was struggling to define whether it was going to be a, a buyer's remorse or a seller's remorse. I mean, what do you think? Is he buying something or is he selling something? Yeah, I know he got all those silver coins in the exchange, but what did he have to give in exchange for that? Was it information? Was it somebody's freedom? The life of someone who at least used to have been considered his friend? Or was he actually selling his own soul? Yeah. I mean, he had to have known the stakes were very, very high, right? I mean, this couldn't have been a surprise. When our text starts out early, early, early Friday morning, he goes trucking back to the temple with the the silver coins. And you can just imagine that those coins are getting heavier and more, more frustratingly jangly every step he takes going back there, right? And he meets up with these people that he was involved in for the transaction. And he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Or thinking, really, right just now you've come to this realization? You just now think that, oh, I've, I've, I've sinned? This is You cannot tell me that this guy didn't know what was happening all along. I mean, it was a few hours ago, but just a few hours ago, that Jesus had personally told him face to face in the Garden of Gethsemane, in that, that, that really crowded olive orchard, exactly what was going on. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And notice the way he says it. He's not asking him if he's betraying him. Jesus didn't have time this evening for all the rationalizations and excuses that had come from a question like that. He was pointing out that you are betraying me, but really with a kiss? Really, you would stoop that low? Is this who you really are? With a kiss, you're betraying me? Have Have you fallen this low? Think of what that says about you, Judas. Yeah, he had to know that this was a betrayal that was going on. And of course, he had to have known it was a betrayal of innocent blood as well. 
I mean, how could he have spent the last three years constantly in contact with this Jesus, constantly in, this, in the face of this evidence that Jesus was the innocent one, the, the innocent one who could point out to all of his enemies, hey, who of you could prove me guilty of sin? And none of them could ever. Innocent in a way that no one else had ever been before. Innocent in a way that had to make so glaringly obvious how guilty Judas was. Jesus was not only innocent, but he was the innocent, the one and only innocent one. And, and, and I know people that will say, well, well, maybe it's this Friday morning, Judas just comes to this epiphany that the consequences aren't exactly what he thought they might gonna, were going to be. And maybe that's why he says now, oh, I've sinned. I, I, I've betrayed innocent blood. Because all along before, he probably thought that, well, this Jesus, he's gotten out of some, some tight spots before. And he could just use that mighty power again, right? And, and this will be, be great because Jesus can get himself out of this situation. And I can still get this, the silver coin. And, and it's kind of win-win. And then when Judas saw that it wasn't playing out the way he had planned or the way he had anticipated, then it's one of those, oh, no, what have I done moments. I don't know. I'm not buying that. Are you? I don't think so. Jesus had made it so very clear, so very often to all his disciples and anyone else who would listen that this was exactly how it was going to go down. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over, betrayed, and then... I'm going to get arrested and executed. That's how it was. Every single time he said it. All the rest of the disciples heard it. All the rest of the disciples got and caught it on to a, at least a certain degree. I remember Peter that one time really getting chewed out. because, oh, no, 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 Lord. That, that, may that never happen to you. But everyone understood this was how it was going to go. Even last night at the meal, that real public announcement of the betrayal and the betrayer. Remember, the disciples absolutely shocked, unthinkable that it could have, been, could have been one of them. And yet Judas, to him, it wasn't so unthinkable, was it? As he gets up to go out the door and do this, that was so unthinkable to everyone else. And Jesus says, yeah, I knew it was you all along, and I knew what you were planning all along. Just get with it and, and do what you were going to do, but do it a little more quickly. Yeah, he was planning all along this sin of betraying innocent blood. He knew it all along, and he went ahead and did it anyway. But in the dawn's early light, as they say, sin doesn't always look exactly the same as it did at night, does it? Neither do some of the consequences of sin. And, and here, it wasn't exactly the way that Judas expected it to be. This wasn't the thing that Judas thought was going to make Judas happy. This wasn't just this one empty spot in his soul that, that now it makes him complete and, and he gets this thing that, that he wanted. And, but it wasn't just last night that this started. This had been going on for a long time and it wasn't just the 30 pieces of silver. Oh, it was becoming more and more to do with, with that, that that was being a bigger part of it all the time. But it had started out so very small that none of his friends noticed from the beginning. None of the disciples recognized it until it was too late. This Judas was a disciple like us. He wasn't one of those, those terrible, awful, wicked people out there doing those terrible, often wicked things that you hear about those people out there doing. He was in, on the inside. He's one of us. He, 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 he's going to church. He, he's doing stuff for Jesus. He looks like all the other believers, maybe even a little better because Remember that he was the one that they picked and decided on to trust with their money. And so here's one who's on the inside and not even his closest friends guessed until it was too late and he had separated himself from them and, and, and from, from Jesus. See, apparently for quite a while, Judas had been anticipating or looking for a theology of glory instead of the theology of the cross. He had been following for quite a while, and he kind of expected that this connection with this Jesus stuff was going to serve in some way, connect him with something that was going to fulfill some of his, his proud and selfish and greedy desires. That going along with this Jesus stuff, well, maybe it would get him some recognition. 
and some praise. Maybe it would even give him some, some social benefits and some financial benefits. But the longer he watched and the longer he listened, the more he realized, no, 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 this Jesus is going to waste the opportunity. This Jesus has the ability, has the power to put us on easy street, and he's not going to do this. This Jesus isn't about getting us stuff. He's about giving away stuff. He's not about dominating. He's about serving. This Jesus was going to uh, make a mess of this whole thing, and this Jesus was going to die, and all the, all the social structures and financial structures and economic structures and, and political structures were going to be the same old thing they were before. And so Judas didn't want any of this anymore. And so that pride inside of him and that greed inside of him and that selfish inside of him just, just festered and like always with sin, sin is always going downhill, and it just keeps on picking up speed to the point where Judas becomes addicted to his sins. We had some evidence of that less than a week ago. They were at that party, remembering that, that lady's pouring the perfume on Jesus' head and, and on his feet, too, that. And it's really expensive stuff. And, and what had Judas done? He stood up and with his best pious voice, his, his, his best church council or pastor voice, he was like, well, that's not good stewardship. And he was looking down on the way that this woman was showing his love, her love for her Savior. And he was acting like, well, we should have done something better with that. That could have been sold. We could have used that money for so much better purposes. We could have given it to the poor. And it sounded like such a pious thing like hypocrite people do try to make their things sound like. But that wasn't the point, was it? Remember how John's gospel told us really he had an ulterior motive? John says that he was the keeper of the bag for the, for the fellows, and, and he would dip into that and take out of it. And that's why he was, he was so concerned, because he was a thief. He used to steal from this. And so here, as is often the case, his seeming pietism, his pietism that looked down on Mary's way of showing love for Jesus, was really just a disguise, wasn't it? It was just a cover for his hypocrisy. And now look at him. Or better yet, according to God's holy word, don't, don't look at him. Look at, look at us. Because you know that he's not being brought out here in front of us for, so we can boo and hiss and throw stuff and, and, and say how evil and rotten and awful he is. Or to be like the, the convicts in the, in the federal prisons, right? They're there for some really heinous, awful crimes. And yet they all have something that, that makes them look down on some other prisoner who's committed a different category of crime. No, when God has Paul write to the Corinthians that things like this are to serve as examples for us and being written down as warnings for us. Or as another spot in the Bible tells us, all scriptures God breathed and is useful. All of it useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And that means, oh yeah, I'm supposed to see me here. But wait a second. I've been with Jesus for years. I went to Sunday school. I, 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 did, I did confirmation. I, 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 I do good stuff for Jesus. Oh, yeah, like Judas. So did Judas. And then I see that my selfishness and my pride and my greed in my heart can make my heart just that cold to put me ahead of everyone else as well. And that I can see myself there kissing my friend Jesus at church on Sunday, but then, then behind the scenes stabbing him in the back by undermining and talking bad. And I see that by the dawn's early light that I've done these same things that Judas was doing. I tell him what a great friend I am and how much I love him. And yet when society gives me an opportunity to trade him in for some security or some praise or some fun or some financial gain or, or what, whatever else it might be, I sell him into second place. I trade him in for the 30 silver pieces of my own convenience, of my own agenda. Like the hymn says, Ah, I also and my sin wrought thy deep affliction. This indeed the cause has been of thy crucifixion. And I realize what a traitor I am. Christ's disciple 
in name, but my commitments are, are all over the board. They're somewhere else. And then, right, then comes the sun. Uh, here comes the dawn, and, and there I am right next to Judas. And I am Judas. And I'm remorseful. How could I have done this? We don't like feeling this way, do we? I mean, we hate it. We, we, we can't stand it. We fight against it. But actually, this remorse, this regret, it's actually a really good thing. It doesn't look like it in the case of Judas. Uh, but it's actually a really good thing because the only alternative, Jesus tells us, is the reaction of those people like the Pharisees. The people who didn't have remorse, didn't have regret for the sins, didn't show any regret for that, only anger and resentment if that sin was pointed out to them. And Jesus says, for, for those hypocrites, they really have no other chance. That's it. There's no chance for them because they're not sorry. At least with the sorry one. At least with the remorse of Judas, there, there was a chance, right? Then it can still go either way. The either way that St. Paul describes when he writes to the Corinthians about, about this man that was taken through what we would probably call church discipline and excommunication. And then in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, yes, you were made sorry. You were made sorry in a godly way because godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation, leaving no regret. But worldly sorrow produces death. Oh, there's two kinds of regret. There's two kinds of remorse. That kind that Judas had, it just ate him up. It consumed him. It drove him despair, to despair. But it didn't have to be like that. It wasn't that he had committed such an extremely awful sin that, that, that Jesus couldn't have paid for it or that God didn't forgive it. That's what Jesus came for. That's this whole plan for Jesus coming to suffer and die in the first place. The Son of God living this innocent life in the place of all of us. And then he also, it says, bore our sins in his body on the cross. That's what God's inerrant, perfect word proclaims to us. All of our sins. By letting Judas hand him over by sacrificing himself, by giving himself up to the death that fulfilled God's judgment and makes us sure that it, enough was done to give us all forgiveness and eternal life. The infinite price that Peter records as not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So the right kind of sorrow that, that recognizes our sin, our need for this Jesus and what he did and, and what he does, that can also be the repentance that realizes what Jesus has done for us and every reason for peace and joy for us. To know that Jesus paid it all. Jesus defeated so all the enemies. He destroyed Satan and sin and death's ability to condemn us or control us or contain us. Jesus paid it all. He bought us for himself for forever. And you and I will rejoice over that transaction forever. No regrets ever for him or for us. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.